we're delighted to have Professor Ariel Rubenstein in Cambridge with us for this year's Marshall Lectures. Professor Rubenstein is a professor of economics at Tel Aviv University and New York University. Among many other honors, Professor Rubenstein is a fellow of the Econometric Society, the Game Theory Society, and the European Economic Association. In sharp contrast to, e to economists' standard focus on markets and prices, his Marshall Lectures will cover norms, social status, and power as a way to resolve resource allocation problems. This promises to be quite a change for normal economists, and certainly for students who are usually taught in terms of prices and markets. What can we learn from this new way of looking at resource allocation? Well, you know, uh, the question is uh, going down to the question of what is economic theory about? And the way that I see economic theory in general is not as a practical uh, tool. I see it as a collection of models, a collection of stories. It's a part of culture. And this particular lecture, as many other of my papers in the last uh, several decades, decades, are actually within the discourse inside economics. So in some sense, the, the, the title, which is Economics with No Games and No Prices, is supposed to be, I wouldn't say challenging, but it's supposed to be in some sense a um, protest against the, the conservatism that I found in the profession about the type of models that we use. When I was very young, then, uh, then German equilibrium was the only thing that economists were talking about. Later, I, uh, game theory became a sort of the, the tool number one in economics. What I wanted to say, okay, this is a collection of models, this is a collection of models, this is a collection of stories, this is a collection of stories. There is no true story, there is no new, true model. Those models are stories. And I want to uh, just to, to, to demonstrate uh, some type of models uh, very formal models. In this respect, it's like models in game theory or in general equilibrium, which are with no games and no prices. That's extremely interesting. And to pick up on that, one of the criticisms we often get from non-economists is that these models, they might tell one story, but they also spit out what might seem like implausible con con conclusions or ones that just don't feel right to us. Mm -hmm. Is this a fair criticism of models and the modeling process, or should we stand by models that we think are good, regardless of what they, they seem to, to yield? Well, given my perspective about economic models, you can guess the answer. The answer is that there is no true model, and it's not the conclusions that are, should be discussed, but actually it's the assumptions. And the analogy is analogy for a movie or for a fiction story or something like that. Namely, how do we evaluate a good story? By the conclusions, by the fact that at the end somebody killed somebody or somebody fell in love with somebody? That's not the way that we, right? It's not the way that we evaluate a story. We evaluate the story as the full stream from the assumptions to the end. The end is important, of course. But the, the, in some sense, the, the setting of the, of the scenery, of the stage, is actually even more important. And it is the move from the beginning to the end which we are interested in the story, right? not the conclusion. And in this respect, I see it exactly like that. I, that's the view, my view about economic models. It's the movement from the beginning to the end. I don't think that there is a right conclusion. That's not my goal. And I don't think that economic models, at least in economic theory, I don't think that this should be their goal. So if what models are is really about telling interesting stories, what can we aspire to achieve with theory, especially with good theory, when we do it well? The same thing that we inspire to, to do with a good story. Just enjoying it enjoying it and uh, interpret it and uh, conclude from that whatever you want. It's, it's, it's investigation about concepts. It's investigation about concept. It's investigation about uh, imaginary situations, which of course are connected to the real world, but they're connected in the real world in a very subtle way. You know, uh, go even to a Disney movie for children. 
it's not completely fantasy. It's a fantasy, but it's a fantasy which is somehow connected to the to the world, right? The same is true about our models. It's a fantasy which is connected to the world. And, and either it's interesting or not, it tells you a story. You and you might actually uh, conclude from the same story different things, and it might affect you in a different way. It's fine with me that any of my models or any, mod any other model <laughs> would be in, in interpreted in, uh, in different ways by different people. I don't want to send a message of you should do something such and such. Not at all, never. I don't want to give advice and I don't think that economic theory gives any advice. So does that mean that these stories, even when they're at their most interesting, they can't really be used for informing policymakers or can we use good stories to does, help? Does policy? the story of Chekhov help, help somebody? It might affect him. Somebody may read a good, uh, a good uh, book and it's all his life, that the, the, the path of life will be affected by the good book that he read when he was 12 or 25, right? So it may be that it's affects or not, but this, to, for me at least, it's not the goal. The goal is not to give advice and I would like even to, wo uh, to warn people from the advice. Look, much of my life I spent uh, on things which are usually categorized as game theory. And game theory is a very, very dangerous field. Why it's a dangerous field? Because it's very catchy. <laughs> You're, even if you are not a communist, you have heard about game theory, the name game theory, game theory, games. Everybody wants to play games. And, uh, and of course, it also the word strategy. The word strategy is also immediately focused the light on, uh, we have now a war in between uh, Ukraine and Russia. That's, uh, game theory must say something about this war, right? Not at all, zero, nothing, in my, to my perspective. But there is a risk why game theory is dangerous in a sense. It's dangerous because it's tempting to say my view is such and such because game theory says something like that and game theory is science and game theory are professors and Nobel winners and so on and so on so they must say something about the world. I don't think so. So is there a risk that economic theory does more harm than good if we're taking the wrong I things out of it? I don't say more, you know, that judgment that would be a little exaggeration. I, I think that there is a, there is a risk that people will use theory, economic theory in general, game theory in particular, in a way that will be more harmful than useful, yes. yes there is a risk like that. It's true probably about some other fields in uh, nuclear physics, probably it's also, it's not clear whether it's good or bad. Uh, but, 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 but let's go to something which I understand a little bit. Yes, there is a danger like that, and I think that we should warn the world that we should be careful and we should be, and as economists in particular, we should be, I would not call it modest, by the way. I don't, I, you know, my position is not modest, not at all. It's not modest because I, 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 I do, um, it, I, it affects it. I, it's true that I don't say that I can say something to the government of, uh, or to the Biden, how to deal with the, the, the war, and uh, even not to the Israeli prime minister. Uh, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, so it's not only that, but the position that I take, that I say categorically, that I don't believe that game theory can say anything about any conflict like that is not a modest position. I take a, take a stand. So it's not modesty, <laughs> but it's a very strong view that I, I feel that uh, I should want and I should uh, voice my... Uh, express my view, a voice against uh, such a use. In a slight change of tack, you commit to making all of your books and your articles freely available on, on the web. What's your motivation for this? Well, my motivation is selfish and not selfish. Selfish, I want people to, 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 to read them. <laughs> and why should I have any burden? I'd say to, in order to get some, some, some pennies or some dollars, that's the sort of motivation I prefer not. Number one. And number two, I should, and uh, again, I, I think that it's also a little bit immoral to, to ask for money for my books. I'm paid very well as a professor, and, I, and, and that's my job. I'm paid for writing books. So why should somebody else pay 
me for the book. They are expenses. But these days, actually, the expenses are very small. You know, you can just put the book on the web and it will be read. That's all. The little, the little that should be, the, the presses should be compensated for their goodwill and good work. And uh, but that's all. So that's my position. And uh, again, uh, I don't want to make money from books. I don't want to really make money. I'm not against making money. If somebody wants to make money, it's fine. But I don't want to do it. And therefore, I put it on the web free. Thank you very much, Professor Rubenstein. We're really looking forward to your martial lectures over the next couple of days.